Hello, hello, Mr. Cooney here with no headset in the basement. Uh, we have come full circle, full, uh, excuse me, full circle here, folks. And uh, Odysseus is finishing telling his tale um, as he leaves Calypso's Island and finally gets to the point where he is telling the story. So this is, uh, it's part two. The, the Odyssey is usually divided into two halves. The first half being Odysseus retelling to where he is and the second half, him going home and dealing with what's home. Uh, the first half is a long one. It's more like two thirds and then, and then the last third. Okay, so book 16 is called Father and Son and reading through the paraphrased part first in books 13 through 15, King Alcinos and his friends send Odysseus on his way home. Odysseus sleeps while the rowers bring him to Ithaca. And when he wakens, he fails to recognize his homeland. It's been 20 years until Athena appears and tells him that he is indeed home. She always helps him out, doesn't she? She disguises him as an old man so that he can surprise the suitors and then urges him to visit his faithful swineherd, Eumaeus. Um, there's a lot of big themes in the Odyssey about the, uh, the loyalty of servants, not slaves, but servants, you know, supposedly lowly employees who, if they're really loyal, should be looked at, not at all as lowly, but more like a good friend. Um, the swineherd welcomes the disguised Odysseus. He's not just disguised like a costume, right? Like he's magically transformed by Athena, so it's a true disguise, and tells him what has been happening in Odysseus's home. Athena, Athena goes to Telemachus and tells him to return home. Remember, he's been out trying to find out whatever happened to his father, right? While the suitors were back in Ithaca plotting against him. Reading on, she warns him of the suitor's plot to kill him and advises him to stay with the swineherd for a night. Telemachus does as she bids. And then Odysseus, and then uh, we finish the story here. But there were two men in the mountain hut, Odysseus and the swineherd. Now notice this is just the storyteller, right? It's no longer Odysseus telling his own story. It's like it's happening in quote unquote real time. At the first light, blowing their fire up, they cooked their breakfast and sent their lads out, driving herds to root in the tall timber. When Telemachus came, the wolvish troop of watchdogs only fawned on him as he advanced. Odysseus heard them go and heard the light crunch of a man's footfall, at which he quickly turned to say, Eumaeus, here is one of your crew come back, or maybe another friend. The dogs are out there snuffing belly down. When it's not even growled, I can hear footsteps. But before he finished, his tall son stood at the door. He hasn't seen his son in 20 years. He was a baby, right? Next page, page 60. The swineherd rose in surprise, letting a bowl and a jug tumble from his fingers and going forward, he kissed the young man's head. So he's glad to see Telemachus back, right? Because Telemachus has just come back from Pylos trying to find out about Odysseus. Going forward, he kissed the young man's head, his shining eyes in both hands and while his own tears brimmed and fell. Think of a man whose dear and only son, born to him in exile, reared with labor, has lived 10 years abroad and now returns. How would that man embrace his son? Homeric simile. Just so the herdsman clapped his back and his arms around Telemachus and covered him with kisses, for he knew the light had got away from death. And he said, the light of my days, Telemachus, you made it back. When you took the ship for Pylos, I never thought to see you here again. But come in, dear child, and let me feast my eyes. Here you are, home from distant places. How rarely anyway you visit us, you and your own men and your woods and pastures. Always in the town, a man would think you loved suitors company, those dogs. And Telemachus with clear candor said, I am with you, uncle. See now I have come because I wanted to see you first, to hear from you if mother stayed at home or is she married off to someone and Odysseus's bed left empty for some gloomy spiders weaving. He wants to know if, if his mom married one of the suitors, right? Gently the forester replied to this, at home, indeed, your mother is, poor lady, still in the women's hall. Her nights and days are wearied with wearied out with grieving for Odysseus that she's still waiting for, as we know, right? Stepping back, he took the bronze shod lance and the young prince entered the cabin over the worn doorstone. Odysseus, who was disguised as an old beggar, remember, moved aside, yielding his couch, but from across the room, Telemachus checked him. Friend, sit down. We'll find another chair in our own hut. Here's the man to make one. So he's being friendly to this person that he assumes is an old beggar without realizing, of course, that it's his own father. A lot of irony there, of course, right? After all this time. 
the swine heard when the quiet man sank down, built a new pile of evergreens and fleeces, a couch for the dear son of great Odysseus, then gave them trenchers of good meat left over from the, pork, from the roast pork of yesterday and heaped up willow baskets full of bread and mixed an ivy ball of honey hearted wine. Then in turn, he sat down facing Odysseus. Their hands went out upon the meat and drink and as they fell to, ridding themselves of hunger. Okay, we'll paraphrase section. Telemachus sends the swine herd to let his mother know he has returned safely. Athena appears and urges Odysseus to let Telemachus know who he really is. Saying no more, she tipped her golden wand upon the man, making his cloak pure white and the knit tunic fresh around him. Live and young she made him, ruddy with sun, his jawline clean, the beard no longer grew upon his chin, and she withdrew when she had done. So she turns him back to normal and maybe even kind of an ideal normal, right? It's kind of an illustration of that there. Next page. Keep having to move my own face around. Feels really weird. <laughs> The Lord Odysseus reappeared and his son was thunderstruck. Fear in his eyes, he looked down in a way as though it were God and whispered, of course, he still doesn't know who he is, right? He has no idea what his father would look even naturally 20 years older than when he left. He wouldn't have any idea of his father's looks anyway because he was a baby, right? It's not like there were photographs or something. Stranger, you are no longer what you were just now. Your cloak is new and even your skin. You're one of the gods who rule the sweep of heaven. Be kind to us, we'll make fair oblation and gifts of hammer and gold, have mercy on us. So he's intimidated, right? Like it must be some supernatural God. The noble and enduring man, noble and enduring man, there's an epithet, replied, no God, why take me for a God? No, no, I am that father whom your boyhood lacked and suffered from pain, for pain, uh, for lack of, I am he. Now at this point, is Telemus gonna go, oh great, and give a big hug? You know, that's gonna be a little bit too overwhelming of information to process, let alone believe right now. Right. Held back for too long, the tears ran down his cheeks as he embraced his son, okay, down Odysseus's cheeks, right? But what is, how is Telemachus receiving this information? Only Telemachus, top of the next page, uncomprehending, wild with incredulity, cried out, you cannot be my father Odysseus. Meddling spirits conceived this trick to twist the knife at me. No man, no man of woman born could work these wonders by his own craft unless a god came into it with ease to turn him young or old at will, which is more irony there, right? Because we know that indeed Athena helped him do this. I swear you were in rags and old, and here you are standing like one of the immortals. Odysseus brought his raging mind to bear and said, this is not princely to be swept away by wonder at your father's presence. No other Odysseus will ever come for he and I are one, the same. His bitter fortune and his wanderings are mine. 20 years gone and I am back again on my own island. Then, throwing his arms around this marvel of a father, Telemachus began to weep. Salt tears rose from the wells of longing in both men, and cries burst from bone, from both as keen and fluttering as those of the great taloned hawk, whose nestlings farmers take before they fly. So helplessly they cried, pouring out tears, and might have gone weeping till sundown. Of course, another comparison there, Homeric epic, right? Or epic simile, excuse me. Telemachus lets Odysseus know they face more than a hundred suitors. Odysseus tells Telemachus to return home. He will follow, still disguised as an old man, so he gets his disguise back. And Telemachus must pretend to not know him. He must also lock away Odysseus's weapon and armor. So it sounds like Odysseus is going to kind of case the joint and figure out what's going on back at his house before he thinks about cleaning house, right? Okay, that I believe is the end of this book. And I'm gonna stop here and give you a little break and do some of those questions maybe on slide 30, I believe. Uh, Father and son, beggar at the manor, I hope I have that right. Uh, and then I'll be back to do book 17, uh, beggar at the manor.